It's in your coffee, your soda, your cookies, and probably half the stuff in your pantry right now. The average American consumes about 80 pounds of sugar every year. That's roughly one and a half pounds per week. But here's what most people don't realize about those white crystals. They come from two completely different plants using processes that are way more complex than you'd think. What you're about to discover isn't just another farming story. It's about how humans figured out how to extract pure sweetness from a tropical grass and a humble root vegetable, creating an industry that processes over 100 million tons of sugar annually. Because the real surprise isn't that we can make sugar from plants. It's that whether your sugar comes from a field in Minnesota or a plantation in Brazil, the final product is chemically identical, even though the processes to get there are completely different. Today we're taking you behind the scenes to discover how two very different crops feed the world's sweet tooth, and why understanding sugar production might change how you think about that innocent-looking bag in your kitchen cabinet. Sugar has been driving human civilization for over a thousand years. Sugarcane originated from New Guinea around 8000 BC, but it took centuries to figure out how to extract and refine it into the white crystals we know today. Sugar beets, on the other hand, are the new kid on the block. They were only developed as a sugar source in the 1700s, when Napoleon needed a domestic sugar supply during wartime blockades. Here's something that'll blow your mind. Sugar beets were originally just animal feed. It wasn't until a German chemist discovered they contained the same sucrose as sugarcane that anyone thought to use them for sweetener. Today, about 80% of the world's sugar comes from sugarcane, while 20% comes from sugar beets. But in colder climates like the northern United States and Canada, sugar beets dominate because they can grow where sugarcane simply can't survive. Sugarcane looks like giant grass because that's essentially what it is, a member of the grass family that can grow up to 20 feet tall. The plants are basically living sugar factories, storing sucrose in their thick stalks as energy for growth. And here's where things get interesting. Sugarcane doesn't grow from seeds like most crops. Instead, farmers plant pieces of cane stalk that sprout new plants. The harvesting process is pretty intense, in many places, fields are still cut by hand using machetes, though modern operations use massive harvesting machines that can cut and load 300 tons of cane per hour. The key is speed. Once cut, sugarcane starts losing its sugar content immediately, so it needs to get to the processing plant within 24 hours. At the sugar mill, the real action begins. The cane stalks get fed into massive crushers that look like industrial-sized pasta makers. These machines squeeze out the juice while leaving behind the fibrous pulp called bagasse. That leftover bagasse isn't waste. It's actually burned as fuel to power the entire sugar mill. Many sugarcane operations are completely energy self-sufficient and even sell excess electricity back to the grid. The extracted juice is dark, cloudy, and full of impurities. It gets heated and treated with lime to remove acids and other unwanted compounds. Then it goes through a series of evaporators that boil off water, concentrating the juice into a thick syrup. The final step involves crystallization in massive vacuum pans, where the syrup is heated and stirred until sugar crystals form. These crystals get separated from the remaining liquid, which becomes molasses, using giant centrifuges spinning at 1,800 revolutions per minute. Sugar beets look nothing like sugar cane. They're white, bulbous root vegetables that look more like oversized radishes. But don't let their humble appearance fool you. These roots can contain up to 20% sugar by weight. Sugar beet farming is highly mechanized, especially in places like Minnesota, North Dakota, and Southern Alberta. Massive machines harvest the beets, top off the green leaves, and load them into trucks in one continuous operation. But here's where sugar beet processing gets tricky. Unlike sugar cane where you just squeeze out the juice, getting sugar from beets requires some serious chemistry. 
The beads get washed and sliced into thin strips called cosettes. These strips then go into massive diffusion towers where hot water slowly extracts the sugar. It's kind of like making the world's largest pot of beet tea, except the tea is sugar-rich juice. The extraction process takes about 90 minutes and uses a counter-current system where fresh water meets the most processed beet strips, while the freshest beet strips meet the most sugar-concentrated water. This maximizes sugar extraction while minimizing water waste. Just like with cane sugar, the raw juice is dark and full of impurities. It gets treated with lime and carbon dioxide to remove unwanted compounds. The purified juice goes through the same evaporation and crystallization process as cane sugar, producing identical white sugar crystals that are chemically indistinguishable from cane sugar. Whether it starts as cane or beet juice, the refining process is where raw sugar becomes the white crystals you buy at the store. Raw sugar is actually light brown and contains about 2% impurities, mostly molasses and other organic compounds. The refining process involves dissolving the raw sugar and treating it to remove remaining impurities. The solution gets filtered through activated carbon and sometimes bone char to remove any remaining color. Here's something most people don't know. The reason sugar is white isn't because it's bleached, but because pure sucrose crystals are naturally colorless. The purified syrup goes through multiple stages of evaporation and crystallization to produce different grades of sugar. The first crystallization produces the largest, purest crystals. Subsequent crystallizations produce smaller crystals and eventually the final molasses that can't be crystallized further. Quality control throughout the process is intense. Sugar purity is measured constantly, and the final product must be 99.9% .9 pure sucrose to meet food grade standards. The scale of global sugar production is mind-boggling. Brazil alone produces about 40 million tons of sugar annually. That's enough to fill about 800,000 shipping containers. The United States produces about 8 million tons, split roughly evenly between cane sugar from Florida, Louisiana, Texas, and Hawaii, and beet sugar from northern states. Here's something that might surprise you. Sugar is actually traded as a commodity on global markets, just like oil or gold. Sugar prices can swing wildly based on weather, politics, and global demand, affecting everything from candy prices to ethanol production. Sugar beet processing happens during a concentrated campaign that lasts about 100 to 200 days, typically from September through February. During this time, processing plants run 24-7 to handle the entire year's crop before the beets spoil. Sugarcane, being a tropical crop, can be harvested year-round in some regions, but most areas have specific harvest seasons when sugar content is at its peak. Not all sugar becomes table sugar. A significant portion gets used in food manufacturing, from soft drinks to baked goods. Molasses, the byproduct of sugar refining, has its own markets. It's used in animal feed, rum production, and even as a dust suppressant on dirt roads. The sugar industry has also become a major player in renewable energy. Many sugar mills now produce more electricity than they consume, selling excess power to local grids. Some facilities are even experimenting with converting sugar directly into biofuels. And here's something interesting for the future. Scientists are working on genetically modified sugar beets that could produce even higher sugar concentrations, potentially revolutionizing the efficiency of sugar production. Whether your sugar comes from tropical cane fields or northern beet farms, the end result is the same. Pure sucrose that's been refined through processes that combine ancient agricultural knowledge with modern industrial precision. 
The next time you add sugar to your coffee, remember that you're enjoying the result of either a year-long growing process in a tropical climate, or a carefully timed harvest from root vegetables that spend months underground. If you found this sweet journey into sugar production fascinating, check out our How Iconic Treats Are Made playlist. From gummy bears to Reese's peanut butter cups to the famous Dubai chocolate, we've got all the behind-the-scenes secrets of your favorite snacks. And now we want to know, what's your favorite sugary treat? And what's the most surprising thing that you learned about sugar production? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, hit that like button and subscribe for more fascinating stories about your favorite treats.